You know, Jonathan did a really good job with uh, with communion and setting up um, Palm Sunday and, and, you know, some of the things that represent. Um, one of the reasons that I really like the story of Palm Sunday as far as from a narrative perspective is because like there's like a donkey in it. I like, I like biblical stories with animals. Um, I like narratives with, because you know, they're, they're usually, they're usually significant. If you, when you read your Bible and you, and you come to a story and there's, there's an animal in the plot, right? There's, there's, they're usually significant. And that's why, you know, that's, that's one of the reasons I, I like this story, um, this account, this historical account. A- another reason I really in- enjoy it is because um, I think it has something to say about kind of who we are as people, right? You, you read about Jesus going into Jerusalem a couple thousand years ago, and there's palm branches on the ground, and people are putting their clothes out for him to, to ride on. And, you, and sometimes you can kind of think to yourself, well, man, you know, what's really going on with this for me? Right? What does this have to say about the current c- political climate of my day? Um, what does this have to say about the way I, you know, whatever country that I'm in, you know? About, what does this say about kings and human nature and, um, and the way we look at things? And it actually says quite a bit. That, that's one of the wonderful things, the beautiful things about the Bible is that if you allow it, it'll say quite a bit about your current situation and it could be thousands of years removed from the situation. You think, well, man, what, what's this man riding in on the back of a donkey have to do with me? You know, and, and it has a lot to do with it. And so that's what we're going to look at. Um, I, I want to read Matthew 21, 1 through 11. Just read this account here of the, what we call the triumphal entry. It says, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village in front of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her untie them and bring them to me. Um, And so if anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord needs them and he'll send them at once. And and so Matthew's drawing back to from common traditions in Genesis um, towards the end of the chapter when Jacob blesses Judah. One of the blessings of Judah is that he will tie his donkey to the vine and his colt to the choicest vine, right? And so there's there's an overlap in Jesus' identity as the son of David from Judah. Um, there. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet saying, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. That's from Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 through 10. We're going to read it in a minute. Uh, So Jesus sees himself and his life squarely in the tradition of of his religion, of his religious tradition. As he, he derives his identity from it, um, he he under he doesn't make the mistake of thinking that he can kind of get too far away from what his role is as a person, what it means to be a person. Um, it, it's fundamentally tied to genealogy and um, our our place in existence as people, which is something you know. If you ponder for a moment, it might blow your mind. Like, okay, I'm actually here. I actually exist. I'm actually aware. That's kind of a big deal, right? Um, the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. <laughs> they brought the donkey and the colt and put them on their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their, spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet. Jesus from Nazareth of, of Galilee. And it's, you know, later on in the chapter, um, <laughs> in verse 14, the children were crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. Chief priests and scribes were indignant. They said to him, do you hear what these are saying? Jesus said to them, yes, have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you've prepared praise. So Jesus is acting with great intentionality here as he comes into Jerusalem. Let's look at Zechariah 9 verses 9 and 10. And so Jesus is, he's setting his, you know, it's everything's really intentional, right? So he's just, he's living his life with great intentionality and great purpose. Um, it, it, is a, it is a purpose-filled life, and he knows exactly where the things are going to be. He sees them squarely 
He sees himself squarely in the scriptures as the fulfillment of them. And, and that's what, you know, everything's bent towards that. So this is Zechariah 9, 9 through 10. This is what's in Jesus's mind, right? When he enters in Jerusalem, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. And the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. I'm going to pray, and we're going to just continue on here. Lord, thank you. Thank you for sending King Jesus. Thank you for Jesus, Lord, and and the salvation that we have through him. And I pray you would teach us something profound about him and something deep and meaningful about ourselves as we look at this, and that we would be more and more like him every day. And you would give us grace and mercy. You would draw us close to you. You would give us the humility. Um, and, I, and I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know what Jesus does is a real big deal. Um, you know, he, he, he could have entered in Jerusalem any way he wanted. But he's like, hey, I need, I need a donkey here. And the, and the reason he needs a donkey is because of, of what we're told in Zechariah 9, verses 9 through 10. Um, Jesus entering into Jerusalem and the triumphal entry is really, it's a, it's a parable of sorts that kind of fulfills every single one of his teachings. So Jesus riding into Jerusalem on the donkey is similar to him telling his followers, if someone compels you to go one mile, go two. If someone sues you and takes your cloak, give him your tunic also. If somebody strikes you on, in the face, turn the other cheek. Those teachings in this event, right? They're not separate. They they do this. They go, and Jesus approaching Jerusalem this way is the embodiment of what it looks like when when a king, right, actually embodies the the teaching of the Torah of, of Yahweh of what it means to be complete and what it means to be whole, right? That, that's what you see riding into when, it, when, the, when the king of the entire created order, all things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. The logos, right? Made flesh from the very beginning that created the reality of existence, the category of existence, right? By which we view reality. When that king, the rightful owner of everything, rides into Jerusalem, as a whole, complete human, he does so in this way. And other kings don't do this. You know, we can learn a lot from art, right? I got some here on the next slide. This right here is Napoleon entering Berlin. Um, It's a little bit different too, right? If you look at the picture, we got a bunch of horses here. Napoleon, of course, is on a white horse, which is significant. Um, for what it symbolizes. That's the thing about us humans. We do all kinds of things, and we don't even know what they mean. You know, we we mount a white horse, we take over territory, we ride into it victoriously, and we don't even understand symbolically what any of it means, or maybe we do, but most people don't. But you see up there on the the colonnade, you got the the horses with the chariots. Um, You've got people kind of flanking in front of Napoleon to keep the commoners away. Um, pretty standard way for, a, for somebody who's triumphant to enter into a city. That's what you'd expect from a king. Look at the next one. This, this next one is a depiction of, what well, you know, Jonathan mentioned, I think, the triumphal procession, right? Um, that, that's, what, that's what this is. And of course, we see of course, battle horses. We see um, people in military garb. They're steel, swords. We have a standard there with a, a bird of prey atop of it. It's kind of gone on the top of the projector so you can't see it. And you know, I was reading a um, psychiatrist's biography, and he had done a little bit of traveling to Native American places and interviewed those people in some places in Africa. And, and they're very suspicious of Caucasians. 
And the reason is because of the way our face looks. We, we generally speaking, have pointy noses and dark eyes, right? We have bird of prey-like features in our face. And Native Americans, people that are, we would call unsophisticated, very suspicious of Caucasians for that reason, because they've watched birds of prey in the wild, and they know what they do, right? And they see somebody that walks up, and they have the features of it, and they go, we better be on the lookout for that person. And if you go back and you just kind of look at some of the symbolisms of, you know, militaristic societies that are, you know, bent on expansion, what do you know? There's birds of prey on our symbols, right? Because there's some sort of truth there. There's something that kind of lends itself to the truthfulness of it. And we don't even know it. We don't even see it because we're sophisticated, right? That's common. That's a common procession there. See the Colosseum in the background? Where, you know, we kill each other for Christians and we feed them to the lions. That's a civilized culture. Now, look at this next one. Okay, this is a very famous painting by Bernard Plotkhorst. It's the uh, it's a painting of the triumphal entry. And it's very different from anything that we've seen thus far. I mean, one of the, the main differences that you'll notice are the children. Look at them. And you've got Another, another difference are the females. The other two we didn't see, there weren't many females that are part of that group, but they're the, the children and the females there, and they're laying down, she's laying down her shirt. And, and there's, there's Christ, he, he's, and he's entering into a realm or a domain that is actually his, that he actually rules. But what's missing from this picture are the horses that are in the other ones. So instead of Napoleon's white horse, you know, Jesus is riding in on a donkey. I think Zacchaeus has made an appearance in the left-hand corner of the picture. You see him up there? You know, some people think that's a little kid, right? No, I think that's Zacchaeus there. You see he's climbing. He kind of looks like a little monkey at first. But, you know, Zacchaeus does have a lot of childlike features. Maybe there's a correlation there in between who Jesus receives in his kingdom and what he's trying to, the, the attitude he's trying to foster from his followers, right? I think Zacchaeus is small in stature. He climbs trees like children. He's the one that Jesus picks. He's, Zacchaeus makes restitution, unlike adults who try to get out of it. We'll hire a lawyer. Um, no offense, Maddie. But that's the wonderful thing about art and the wonderful thing about, about paintings is that they convey something that's real about events. They, they, they pierce into what most earthly kingdoms are esteem. I had some modern stuff in here too, you know. So you can imagine um, the Nazis going through Poland victoriously with the tanks rolling through. The other military parades, North Korea, Russia. Former President Trump had a military parade a few years back for the United States. There's some in uh, England as well. Um, that's just, co it's common. It's a common kind of theme, right? Which makes what we're looking at and what we just read. So that's why I'm showing you, because this is, this is the way this works. It makes this fascinating because we don't necessarily esteem children, right? You can find all kinds of kids marching in Nazi Germany in 1933 in the Hitler Youth Parade, which is somewhat, you know, the point of the chief priests and the elders really losing their mind 
when they say, Jesus, you hear what these kids are saying? Got to protect the kids. Well, not in Christ's kingdom. They're, they're a big part of it. They are the ones that actually tell the truth about it. That's what's ironic about this, is they actually are the ones that are telling the truth. And so in this story, in this picture, we're confronted with a king that breaks every archetype of a king, that breaks every mold of a king, a king of kings of sorts, a preeminent king. that confronts the world in a much different way than any other king does. That promotes submission within the world in a much different way than any other king does. And, and what this painting, what the scripture does when we allow it is that, and the reason it's so powerful is it's because it confronts something deep inside us that's, that's drawn to some of the other paintings and portraits and mode of, of being. And you might say, well, I'm not necessarily for that kind of expansion. I don't like to see tanks and I don't like to see displays of power and force. Maybe not from a military perspective, but you, you certainly do and I certainly do when it comes to our own lives. We certainly do have conqueror mentalities from time to time. When a promotion's on the line, right? Or, you know, when someone speaks evil against us, and we, we will villainize them because they don't agree with us. And better yet, what, what this really confronts is, is this question. This question. How in the world, right? This is Zechariah. Will this king, who comes humble and mounted on a donkey, cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem? I mean, how will he do it? I mean, there's nothing in the photo. I mean, there's, there's not even a sword in there anywhere. What's he going to use to break the bow? How are we going to get the wheels off the chariot? How are we going to hamstring the horses? I mean, there's no guns back then. What are we going to use? How does this person do what we read about in Zechariah 9, 9, and 10? That's a good question. And that really was the problem because they were about as capable of answering that question as we are. I don't know how that all works. But, but what it does reinforce is, is this. There's a way of being and living in the world that makes sense to us on one level that's absolutely incongruent with reality like trying to make peace with war. You might get a period of peace, but just let history play itself out a little bit. And what are you messing with again? And so a couple of hundred years, another generation is, is confronted with the same reality that we're confronted with. But what you have in this photo is a call, right, for us in our lives, personally, and this is how it applies to us, is that sometimes even when it doesn't make sense, we would do well to, as it says in Zechariah, cut the war horse from Jerusalem. Because here's the thing about us. There's all kinds of war horses and chariots that we're dealing with and bows and swords. Some of you have may, maybe even used them this morning. Right? 
And so you look at a picture like this and you say, well, how do I get peace in my marriage? How, would I, how do I get relational harmony with someone with whom I disagree? Because, you know, I like to imagine on the other side of that painting, what's, what is this Christ confronted with? Well, if you look to the, you know, I think Zacchaeus is hidden on the far right. If you look to the far left, there's an elderly gentleman. He looks a little malevolent. You see him? See the guy? He's kind of behind the lady that has the black. I guess it's a turban. I don't know what it's called. But that's kind of the guy that Jesus is going to confront here. Hey, maybe that's who your spouse confronted this morning. Maybe you woke up looking like that guy. You know? Well, what does Jesus do when he enters into a place that's filled with that guy? What does the king do when, I mean, what are you going to do? Sacrifice the kids? Who's going to protect that king? Well, that cuts the war horse off from Jerusalem. Because that kind of king says, hey, you compelled me one mile instead of insisted on my own rights. I'm going to show that I actually have complete and utter freedom by not complaining about the one mile and willingly going to. That's, that's what that does. And when you do that in marriage, for instance, it looks a lot less like the Napoleon scene. Because that's really the issue in our relationships, right? Is we want to think of ourselves as Napoleon and our spouse is not pictured. And one of the reasons that she's not pictured in the Napoleon scenes because we probably killed them by the way we act. <laughs> and that's just, look, that's just who we are as people. That's just who we are. I have a hard time forgiving somebody that's sinned against us, right? We don't want to cut the war horse off from our life and replace it with some sort of donkey that I have to ride in a spirit of humility to try to seek out some sort of peaceful way forward with this. I'd rather just mount the war horse and just, you know, off with their head. Maybe it's an estranged relationship, you know? Somebody did something unthinkable to you in your past. And you just can't manage to get on that donkey. Maybe the best we can do sometimes is act like it. Sometimes that's what happens, right? Sometimes my painting, I'm, there's no one on me, but I'm the donkey. And I think that's why this is such a powerful event is because it confronts my propensity to say, okay, well, I can, I can, I can try to be for peace in certain situations, but actually in, 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 some, in most situations, a lot of my, my life doesn't look like Christ. It looks like Napoleon. I'm just taking territory. Get on the train or get off, you know? Man. And what this picture also shows us, right? Because if you fast forward a little bit, you know, one, one of the reasons we'd rather have the Napoleon picture is because he's not on a cross. Right? That king doesn't get crucified. This one does. That's what happens. When you ride into a city like ours, claiming to be its king like that. Because we can't deal with that here. That's the message. That's the gospel message. We fundamentally really can't deal with that here. We don't know what to do with people like this. We don't. Because people aren't like this. And so, 
We knock Zacchaeus out of his tree and proceed to gather a mob as the malevolent old man there. He's going to yell at the clouds in a little while. You know, that's what we do. But what this represents, right? You merge these two together is actually the only way to be in the world that's human. That, that, that's the thing about it is if, if we can take this, what this represents, what that picture tells us about human nature, right? It'll completely change everything about who we are because it'll confront everything about who we are. It will confront how we leverage our resources to be Napoleon or to be like Napoleon because that's one of the things we'll do because resources equal power, information equals power. Knowing people, reading people equals power so we can subjugate them to get whatever we need out of the situation. And so you start playing this out in your head a little bit and start riding into some of the kingdoms that, if I start riding into the kingdoms that I've built and the relationships that I'm a part of in my circle, when I start riding into those, you know, you're confronted with, okay, what does my painting look like? Have I cut off the war horse? Or do I have a stinking cavalry barreling behind me? And you know the answer to that question, just like I do. You don't need me to apply it for you. And if you got somebody in your family that has a cavalry behind them, you know that they have a cavalry, and they're not coming in like that. But what, if you fast forward it and you get through the passion narratives, right? You think about Psalm 2. Psalm 2 is, you know, the kingdoms of the earth and the nations plot themselves together against the Lord and his anointed saying, come, let us break this bond and these chains apart. The one in heaven laughs. He holds them in derision. As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I've said to you, you are my son. Today I've begotten you, right? That Psalm there, you read through Matthew and it, it, the fulfillment of that Psalm happens in a way that we don't understand. Jesus is installed in Zion on his holy hill. He is. You know, the scepter that the king in Psalm 2 uses to rail the nations and break them like a potter's vessel. You know that scepter? That's the scepter that's given to Jesus after they put a, a, the soldiers crown him in king's clothes, twist a crown of thorn, put him in it, beat it on his head. They give him a scepter. That symbolizes Psalm 2. It's just not what we think yet. And that, that's the point. It just keeps going back to that. Very little evidence that, that there's a title over any crucified person, except for Christ. You do a little bit of research on that. It's not a common thing. King of the Jews in three languages. He set his king on Zion, his holy hill. And it looks like riding into your situation on that donkey looks like death. But here's the deal. It's not. Because then three days later, he'll be risen from the dead. And even though the day after is April Fool's, no one is going to say, sight. He's still risen. What does that tell you about this? Here's what it tells us about this. It tells us it, that this is the way, actually. That if, that if I choose this in my life, it's prone to go in a certain direction. I might have some immediate pain and temporary discomfort, but I'm much better off than I would be otherwise. That, that's, the, that's one of the points. That if I, okay, if I can choose this, if I can cut the war horse off from my life, that, that I feel like I need to ride so I can survive. Because that's why, we, that's why we ride the war horses, right? That's why we battle. That's why we fuss. That's why we fight. That's why we manipulate. That's why we try to, you know, 
put ourselves in the best position, that's why we try to control situations, is we think the war horse is the path to life. And what this picture shows us and what this passage shows us is that it's actually not. Jesus says something similar, like when he says things like, put your sword in its sheath, whoever takes the sword will die by the sword. It's the same concept. You think that this is the thing you need. If you take this to its further possible extent, it will kill you. That's the message. You think the war horse gives security. You think the chariot makes you strong, but it doesn't. It's weakness. This is the way to life, and it looks like death. And so when Jesus rides in to Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, he is doing something, right? that doesn't look esteemed, that doesn't look powerful, that doesn't look life-giving, that people will just forget about, you know, do away with a few days later, but it's actually the only way to be. It's the only way to be. That's the point. That's why it's a powerful message. That's why it's a powerful event. It says, follow the king like a child, lowly, like the status of a woman in those days, humbly like your king on a donkey. He comes to you that way. And that's what you get ultimately in the book of Revelation. Revelation 19, 11 through 21. We're gonna end here. And this is the good, this is the great news. If you're a Christian, that previous picture, go back one more time, Daniel. That's the way that Jesus approaches you today. That's the way he's approached every one of his children. Humbly, kindly, Think about it. Think about if, if our sins and the way we live offends an infinitely powerful, all-knowing deity like Yahweh. We got some major problems, right? Especially if he's got his war bow down. You know, it's, the, it's part of the rainbow and one of the, one of the you know, reasons for the rainbow is that it's, it symbolizes the war bow pointing towards heaven and not towards earth. The wrath goes that way. You won't destroy the earth or water. That's one of them. The, the, but if God's war bow is pointed down, we're in trouble. Just ask, I don't know. You can't really ask them. But just ask the scuba divers in Noah's generation how that turned out. The snorkelers there. You know? The long line of sailors that are descended from Noah. I mean, that's where they come from. But that's what happens. And what this tells us is that I've broken the war bow. I've taken the wheels off the chariots. And I put the horses in the petting zoo. Right? That's what this picture says. And you can come to me that way. And you can, oh, thank the Lord. And if we live that way, this reap what you sow kind of, that's what we experience in our life, in our marriages, in our relationships. You, you actually get the harmony of heaven now if you can get off the horse, off the war horse. If I can get off the war horse and stable him, if I can take my sword and beat it to a plowshare and farm with it, my life will, it will more than likely produce certain fruits that are congruent with the kingdom of heaven. But if I stay on the war horse, this is the, t the terrible thing about it. I've got one coming for me. Because, you know, you read in Revelation 19, verses 11 through 21, this. I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is, he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood and the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. All right, we're back to Psalm 2, right? We, the, the rod iron in Jesus' passion narrative. was just a little thing of hyssop used to mock him. 
He will tread the wine press, press of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty. On his robe and his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so this is one of the things that this passage means, right? Is that God is just and he's true. And so is his word. And if the word of God, right, tells us, hey, this is what happens when people don't get off their war horse and onto the donkey. Why are we surprised when we get to the end of things that we're met with the animal that we refuse to dismount? One of the things it means when it says he wages war with righteousness and justice is that this isn't some like, you know, God's being, sure is being a jerk to a lot of people slaying them with his mouth sword. No, it's a way for, to get our attention saying, look, if <laughs> the, the word of God, the, the, the word of God, the logos become flesh, Jesus Christ. In this depiction, the, the rider on the white horse with the mouth sword it will either defend the pe- it defends the people that live by it, and it destroys the people that don't. Put your sword in its sheath. Whoever takes the sword will die by the sword. It's that concept. Is that when 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 you take the word of God and use it as a way to order your life in submission and faith to Christ, you get the donkey. You get defense. He silences the mouth of the avenger. But if you don't, you get the thing you rode your whole life, which is this angry horse, and the word of God becomes a sword, a prophetic sword against you. Your own choices come back on your head. That's what it means that he's just. He wages war injustice. That's what it means. And so part of being saved by grace through faith is actually looking at the word of God, which is our sword of the spirit and going, okay, what am I gonna do with it? Am I gonna submit to it by faith and have it be my defense? Or am I gonna choose a different path and then one day look up at the end of all things and wonder why this rider on a white horse with a sword coming out of his mouth is coming at me so quickly and then act like I've never seen it before in my life when our whole life is lived riding it. That's the point. And so this is the concluding exhortation. Hey, stable that war horse. If you're a Christian, the war bow has been broken. No weapon fashioned against you shall stand. That's another way to say it. The lives of the enemy, the tongue of the one who would want to spitefully use you and mistreat you, it has been silenced. And you, having been justified by grace through faith, I, having been justified by grace through faith, can actually make for peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall inherit the earth. That's the Christ that you want to go to. That's the Christ that'll change your life. It's the Christ that'll change your marriage. It's the Christ that'll change your relationship with your kids. It's the Christ that'll change the way we see money. It'll change, it's the Christ that'll change the way we forgive and not hold on to bitterness and just ugliness. And it'll Christ, the Christ that'll replace our pouting and our just, uh, with just joy of our salvation. It's that one. And there's no war horse waiting for you. But the warning is this. It looks like Napoleon's entering into Berlin. It looks like life, man. That looks like victory. It looks like we can do something with that. You can't. It won't. The horse that gives you security in this life, it'll be your demise. It'll be your demise. And it'll be your choice. And so that's what the Lord does. He says, hey, I hold before you today good and evil. Choose the good. 
please choose the good. Choose this way. It's life. The other way is death. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the way that you love us and for your word. I pray you would help us to choose life. We're thankful that through the blood of Jesus Christ, you defanged and detongued and dethroned Satan's from, Satan from our heart when we respond to your gospel in faith. And I pray that you would help us to do that. That you would help us repent of the propensity to fashion weapons and vehicles and modes and methods of war to do our own conquest, to do our own bidding. Forgive us, grant us repentance from, repentance from that way of life and, and grant us the humility that will accept Christ's perfect path of peace as our King of kings and our Lord of lords. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.